Lester, Wushu Engineer. I've released quite a few videos already showcasing our unique impulse block methodology and the equipment which allows for uh, what is possibly um, one of the most detailed analysis or analyses of human striking that is currently available. Using the full methodology along with the attendant uh, measuring equipment allows us to determine can, um, impulse, numerically filtered uh, impact force, impact duration, instantaneous impact velocity, uh, kinetic energy of the impact and the power of the impact. I encourage you to check out my other videos on the subject for uh, more information and context. Using the simplest base uh, impulse block approach, the method involves the calculation of impulse from the raw force time curve uh, generated by a load cell. This represents the change in momentum that a target would experience due to a strike. Impulse and impact duration can then be recorded for a particular strikes and this information can be used on its own to track an athlete's striking performance over time. However, impulse being the change in momentum um, has units of either newton seconds or kilograms kilogram meters per second and is thus a product of the mass behind an impact measured in kilograms and the velocity of an impact measured in meters per second. As such, <clears throat> if you have access to either the velocity or the mass of an impact, you can calculate the remaining unknown variable by dividing impulse by the known variable, whether that's velocity or the mass of the impact. In human striking, the mass of an impact or the mass associated with an impact is a quantity known as apparent mass. And this is very hard to determine or calculate because of the complexity of human biomechanics and will thus typically be the unknown quantity. However, it is relatively easy to measure the impact velocity of the part of the body performing the strike, for instance, an elbow. In our case, after some research, considering methods uh, uh, to determine this velocity, to calculate this velocity, such as accelerometer-based uh, velocity extrapolation and microwave Doppler velocity measurement, what we found was that the easiest way to do this would be to measure the time of flight between two points just before the point of impact using a pair of photo gates. So I set out to do this using discrete logic components instead of doing this with a, a microcontroller. You could argue that this project would have been far easier to build using a microcontroller. But in this case, I just decided excuse me, to reduce the overall system complexity, overheads and the potential timing issues by using a discrete components, discrete logic components and opting for a more difficult build instead. I also did not have any microcontroller programming platforms available at this time, um, which is uh, probably one of the main defining reasons anyway. Uh, I have a lot of experience using microchip uh, PIC products, but I've budgeted and planned to get hold of an Arduino platform for future projects within the next month or so. Simply put, to describe the system's operation, the object whose velocity we are or we are wish wishing to measure would break, would first break the first light beam of the first photo gate, switching on a timer. After which, the object would then break the second beam of the second photo gate, switching the timer off. This would thus be a record of the time of flight of the object between the two photo gates. Now, in order to approach an instantaneous velocity measurement, the two photo gate points should be as close together as possible. I originally was going uh, to default to using a 10 centimeter gap, but eventually I decided that this was just too large of a gap, and I opted for a 1 centimeter gap instead. There would be very little change in velocity in the last centimeter of a conventional strike, which could interfere with this measurement. As such, um, this is a reasonable approximation of the instantaneous velocity of the impact. Of course, this small of a gap would necessitate a very high clock speed 
in order to get an accurate measurement of the time of flight. So I decided, to, uh, I decided on a, a one megahertz clock signal. In other words, recording the time of flight in microseconds between the two photogates. Because the typical, typical decade counters have a maximum clocking speed of six megahertz. And one megahertz would thus be a convenient sub-maximal value uh, to choose. As a matter of interest, a one megahertz clock speed with a 10 centimeter gap would be sufficient to at least register a velocity of 100,000 meters per second, which is nearly 10 times the Earth's escape velocity. However, with a one centimeter gap, this is of course reduced. We have to satisfy ourselves with a system that may be able to register a speed of only 10,000 meters per second, which is just less than the Earth's escape velocity, or approximately 36,000 kilometers per hour. Note that I say register here and not measure because these kinds of velocities may only register as a single count on the clock, not making the measurement very accurate or reliable. Needless to say that uh, no human being outside of a comic book uh, would be moving at these kinds of velocities. Well, at least not intentionally, uh, in a state of good health or with very long to live anyway. So the system is somewhat over-engineered. I like to live up to my catchphrase. There were quite a few problems encountered during the design and build, starting with the uh, very first components ordered, the phototransistors and the, in the infrared or IR diodes. The components that we opt opted for came as a pair, an, an IR diode and a paired phototransistor, with a supposed range in excess of 91 centimeters according to the data sheet. Um, this would have been perfect, actually, but the data sheet was um, not representative of reality. I think it was a beautiful lie. I was not able to get more than 15 to 20 centimeters of useful range between the emitters and the detectors. As such, I had to use some standard red laser diodes instead which was fine because they would allow us to extend the range between the emitters and the detectors significantly and allow for more precise alignment. Instead of going into too much detail here on the build process, uh, in terms of like a conversation about it, I'll share some of the clips that I took during the design and build process instead. So this is the setup, uh, uh, just a test prototype setup on a breadboard. Just going to turn on the power now, and you'll be able to see the little laser beams that are that are um, one centimeter apart, and uh, those are the photo detectors, photo diodes. Those are the lasers. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, you'll see the uh, the I've just got one seven segment display active at the moment. This is a test to see whether it's working or not. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to reset the NAND gate latch which is wired up on that on that set of uh, quad NAND gate, that quad NAND gate um, IC over there. And uh, then what I'm going to do is hopefully you can see this now. I'm going to I'm just going to interrupt these beams one at a time, and you'll see as I as I interrupt the first beam, the timer has actually started uh, started or at least the decade counter has started counting. You can't see the display flicker because it's counting at one megahertz at the moment which is too fast for you to see. But when I break the second, it will stop counting. And this time it just so happened to stop on either four or nine. The one segment isn't, is, is a little bit dicey and isn't actually lining up. Um, and when I withdraw, you'll see that the display is latched due to the NAND gate latch that I've used, storing that one bit of information. And then in order to reset, we've got to 
reset the NAND gate latch and uh, then we can start that process all over again. Just running it off a 9 volt power supply at the moment through a 5 volt regulator which you'll see over there. That's uh, um, uh, a, an IC containing uh, it's a hex Schmidt trigger IC and that I'm using in an a stable configuration uh, to generate the 1 megahertz clock signal which is being fed into the uh, decade counter which is being gated um, with one of these photodiodes and then the latched uh, latched output of the second gate through the NAND gate latch built into that IC over there or built around that IC over there. So I've been burning the incense to appease the machine spirits, the machine god and uh, uh, this is what the circuit looks like at the moment. Been doing a few tests and it seems to be operating as expected. So um, there are the uh, lasers and the phototransistors. Um, and if I, I'm just going to move this object across the beams rapidly, and you'll be able to see. I just so happened to have moved it across and gotten that particular count. Um, so we can reset the circuit, reset that NAND gate, the NAND gate latch, say a couple of prayers to the machine spirits, and we'll do that again. And there we go. So in this case, it was 8037. Of course, this is being clocked at uh, 1 megahertz. So essentially, 1 million cycles per second. So um, there are many, 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 many counts that occur in the short space of time that it takes me to move this object across the 1 centimeter gap um, between the two laser diodes and the two phototransistors. So here's the system as it is. There are a couple of problems with it at the moment. I'll demonstrate a couple of them to you. Um, so just uh, reset. First of all, you'll notice that there are six digital outputs and actually a total of seven. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, decade counters. For some reason or other, the first decade counter is just not playing along and isn't counting. So you'll notice that I've I've taken the I've taken the output from the um, from the, the um, Schmidt trigger A stable, and I'm actually taking it directly to the cl the clock input on the second decade counter. Um, and that seems to be working, I'll, but there is another issue that comes about, and as you can see, the the clock the clock signal is currently not connected. And I'll show you what happens when I move something across the gap. Um, oh, now it's not playing along. Let me reset again. Oh my goodness, this is driving me mental. So, I think I've got it 
working a bit now. It's still unstable though, so there's an instability. It's not uh, it's not working all the time, but it's being a bit more consistent now. Hopefully, it behaves itself so that I can show you what's going on. So I'll just turn on the power supply now um, and just uh, do a reset. So there are all the counters. Lasers are on, and I've got the oscilloscope on, so I can show you what the um, what the actual clock signal looks like. But let's have a look at uh, driving it. So there we go. So it came on and recorded something. At time it was quite a slow movement, as you can see, it's latched onto that now. And in order for me to uh, measure again, I'll have to reset, reset all the clocks, reset the NAND gate latch, and uh, then I'll just do it a little bit faster this time. Okay. So as you can see, the very the very last digit did not clock over. Um, so I'm just going to reset, and I'm going to interrupt the first beam but not the second so that uh, as you can see it's it's clocking its way through now and I can show you what the what the clock pulse looks like so there's the clock pulse on the oscilloscope I've got it at uh, 0.2 uh, 0.2 microseconds per division so if you see that's uh, a total of five divisions which is uh, one microsecond uh, for a full cycle obviously one megahertz but anyway just to show you what it looks like not the cleanest of signals but there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, kind of components in here and so that the um, the square wave is going to be affected in all kinds of weird and wonderful ways and I'm not expert enough to track down all of that of course a lot of it might even be affected by the circuit layout itself because this is a fairly high frequency clocking signal so you know there'll be uh, there'll be inductance and there'll be there'll be capacitance between tracks which is going to affect the the circuit to a certain extent but at, at the very least it is clocking um, so now comes the really 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 tricky part of transferring this into the circuit. Fortunately, I do. Um, I'm only using one NAND gate here. Um, sorry, I'm using a NAND gate there. Um, and essentially, what I'm doing in order to make this function, what I've had to do is literally reconstruct the uh, the clock input of one of these uh, one of these um, counter counters. Um, so I've got a NAN, I've got a NAND gate um, because that's what I actually have on the board. I've got one spare NAND gate left on that chip, uh, and I'm putting one of the existing signals from the circuit through a Schmidt trigger just to really just to invert it, and then it is being uh, it's being combined in the NAND gate with the uh, with the output from the uh, uh, from the one megahertz uh, a stable um, Schmidt trigger arrangement here and that's producing an output which is going into the first of the counters and uh, so what happens is when the logic decides that the gate has been interrupted um, it it uh, it allows the output from the uh, the A stable to be seen by the counters. So yeah, um, what should have been a simple operation, uh, uh, controlling all of that using the uh, using the clock inhibit, turned out to be um, a, r a real real problem because every time I try to uh, try to affect the, or at least try to trigger the inhibit signal or, or take the inhibit signal from high to high to low it would just all of the counters would detect one clock signal which put in that uh, uh, one 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 uh, which um, 
stuffed up the uh, stuffed up the, uh, the, the, the the count so yeah so I'm gonna have to now transfer that onto the circuit as I said I've got one I've got one um, NAND gate left that I can use there and I've got a couple of spare uh, Schmidt triggers on that chip over there so I'm gonna have to transfer this but uh, you know there's always as many a slip twixt the cup and the lip and um, hopefully that goes according to plan and I don't have to sit fiddling with this blimmin circuit any mu uh, for much longer anyway alright finally I think I tracked the little blighter down and the intermittent fault that I was getting and the winner of the prize is this dude right here I think what might have happened when I was constructing the circuit because I've actually got you'll note that I have seven um, seven decimal counters on the circuit I'm actually only using six of them at the moment to drive the six uh, LED um, seven segment LED displays uh, because the first stage here started giving me problems and just it, it just didn't respond to the clock signal at all um, and of course for any of you who know what uh, development on breadboards is like or, or on VeraBoard as well and uh, you know sort of building and prototyping it's quite possible that I fried that poor poor chip Anyway, I've I've disconnected the uh, I've disconnected that from the rest of the chain, and it seems as though touch wood, the um, the problem has the intermittent problem has been resolved. So, and I've also transferred the the new input stages. As you can see, it's a bit of a blooming mess over there. But anyway, this is the first prototype board. Um, I've amended my circuit diagram to incorporate all of this. But yeah, I had to I had to build a um, I had to build essentially build a clock inhibit and clock input stage. The the the, um, the stages that actually are supposed to be present in all of these uh, decimal counters. I had to build it externally and feed that purely into the clock so I'm gating the I'm gating the clock signal with my logic uh, my logic signal um, from the uh, from the light uh, the the pho photo um, transistors and and the, the uh, NAND gate latch that's that's uh, sort of remembering the state that they're in um, yeah so it's been a, a it's uh, it's been real so I'll switch the thing on there we go. That's the. Uh, I'm just powering the lasers separately. Switch on the circuit. Displays come on. Reset. And let's just uh, clock it over. There we go. So it's working. Of course, now it's it's latched, so it doesn't matter whether I remove it or or you know, or break the beams again. It's uh, latched until I reset which also resets the decimal counters so it resets the logic and the decimal counters and break it again and there you go so this as I said has been real it's been a process but anyway I've, I think it's I think it's done now very relieved as you may be able to pick up from these clips I built the circuit on bearer board I have quite a bit of bearer board lying around and it's convenient for me to use. With the complexity of this circuit, it would have been a pain in the aegis to design, design it without using a uh, circuit design software package. I ended up using a software package called VeraRoot, which worked really well and uh, which allows you to design standard PCBs or convert them to Vera board track layout. I'd strongly recommend the software package for the weekend tinkerer and prototyper who finds it easier to build on VeraBoard than sending files away and waiting for PCBs to be printed only to find that they made a bit of a stuff up in the design and have to start again. There are of course uh, sources of error inherent in the system design, although they have been minimized as far as possible.
One is the accuracy of the one centimeter gap between the two photo gates. Uh, this was kept as accurate as possible, although achieving a perfect one centimeter gap is difficult. Another potential significant source of error is variation in the spatial point at, um, at which the uh, sensor registers that the beam, uh, the light beam, has been broken. A source of error that can safely be ignored due to the typical velocities being measured by the system is the small amount of lag in the circuit. After a fair amount of testing, adjustment and calibration to account for and minimize these errors, I performed a final set of calibration drop tests and this is what they looked like. Three, two, one, oh. Three, oh, seven, eight. Three, one, eight, two. Three, two, six, six. Two, three, oh, oh. Two, three, eight, four. Two, two, six, three. Two two four one two three one three one six five four one six four One five nine nine. One six five one. As you can see, the drop test measured results were pretty close to the expected velocity. Of course, I was just dropping the ball by hand using a laser level to get the required height. Um, therefore, there would still be significant associated human error. So it's difficult to establish whether the measured values were more accurate or less accurate than the expected results. In addition, these were pretty low velocities compared to what could be expected in terms of human impact. So we performed another set of striking tests using an expanded polystyrene ball on the end of a stick. We filmed these tests using the super slow-mo uh, setting on our mobile phone which allows the filming of a few seconds of footage at 960 frames per second. In order to calculate a comparative velocity from this information, we used the free software package Canovia, which is often used by sports scientists to perform simple biomechanical analysis of human movement captured on video. This is another software package that I would strongly recommend for those who are interested in some simplified motion capture analysis to track sports performance. In this case, we were able to use Canovia to track the polystyrene ball in the high speed footage and the Canovia software was able to provide um, a velocity measurement based on the movement and the video footage frame rate. This is what the tests looked like with the high speed footage as analyzed in the Canovia software shown in the inset screen. And go. Nine. Go. Four, eight. Okay. Four. Oh. Okay. You get it? Yeah. Four. Five.
Because we did not have access to a higher speed camera and with us only dealing with a couple of frames in which movement was recorded, there was a significant margin for error in the motion capture velocity measurements. However, the values were in good agreement with the velocities as measured using the laser photogate timer. I was actually very happy with these results and breathed a sigh of relief. The laser photogate timer was functioning as well as could be hoped for. At this point, we performed another set of tests, a set of additional tests as requested by a viewer in relation to my previous video on the Nunchaku versus stick, during which I compared the impact velocity of a tennis ball on a string when using a single swing and after spinning the ball multiple times prior to impact. I first wanted to establish what the rotational speed of the ball was when I was just spinning it as fast as I could. So we took some super slow-mo footage of me swinging the tennis ball as fast as I could and I got the Wushu scientist to run it through the Conovia software package. And this is what that test looked like. Okay, and go. <laughs> What you might be able to tell from the footage is that it actually takes effort on my part for me to keep an object spinning as fast as I can, even a lightweight object such as a tennis ball. This is not an energy efficient tactic. I was quite surprised to see that the rotational speed of the tennis ball appeared to be in the range of 15 to 16 meters per second. This was considerably less than the impact velocities recorded during my previous tests. So I performed another set of three impact tests to confirm this, and this is what those tests looked like. That's 591. Four hundred and seventy-eight. Four hundred and ninety-nine. So as you can see from the results, what was surprising was that the impact velocities were in line with the values measured in the previous set of tests, uh, in the tests performed uh, in the Nunchaku versus Stick video. This seems to indicate that the impact velocity was higher than the rotational speed of the spinning object. In other words, I was actually increasing the velocity of the spinning object during the moment of impact to attempt to bring it closer to the impact velocity that can be achieved from a single swing. It appears that this result may back up my statement from my previous set of tests in the Nunchaku versus Stick video that spinning movements do not add velocity to the final impact velocity of the spinning object over what can be achieved with a simple swing. My viewer also asked me to perform a spinning test in which I moved forward while performing the strike. And this is what those tests looked like. Six hundred and thirty nine. Six hundred and forty five. As you can see from these results, the impact velocity was actually much lower than when I remained stationary. These impact velocities were more in line with the rotational speed of the object as measured using the Conovia software. This seems to indicate that I was unable to add much or anything to the final impact velocity um, as I was able to when stationary. This was possibly due to a training deficit on my part, uh, causing inefficiency in the movement. I would say that with additional training in this movement, I would be able to increase the impact velocity to match the impact velocity that I could achieve when stationary. However, additional benefits in terms of impact velocity due to moving during the impact using a continuous spinning, spinning method may not be significant enough just to justify the additional training load when a similar benefit could arguably be achieved while moving during an impact with a single swing. 
So I hope you enjoyed this video describing the uh, laser photogate timer um, and I'll see you all again next time. Cheers.